Okay, so today um, our lecture, I have a few agenda. One is I would like to go into the detail of the mapper algorithms. Um, this is one of the most popular tool. Um, the second one, if we have time, I would like to go into the actual computation of homology and persistent homology. We kind of get a taste of it at the beginning of the semester where I kind of give a picture view of it. Um, but this time we're going to try to compute it by hand for very small examples. And then, of course, if I have more time, I'm going to show you the software, one of those many software that compute persistent homology. Okay. So today, um, let's start with Mapper. As I mentioned before, there's a, a few, you know, uh, interesting YouTube video I'm hoping you have watched. If not, you know, it's a good uh, video to watch uh, on YouTube um, is talking about how to use topology and specifically Mapper to detect uh, fraud and also to look at uh, stratification of patient population. Okay. So, and also there has been efforts to try to do it in very large scale using Spark. All right, so on the high level, right, the mapper algorithm is both a tool for high dimensional data analysis as well a tool for visualization. Uh, when I say high dimensional data, you know, one way of representing high dimensional data is the one where you can imagine I have a large table where each row is a data point and each column is a dimension of the data point. For example, each row can be say a patient ID and each column can be uh, sort of the weight, the height and then uh, genetic profiles of a particular patient. Okay. Another example, of course, in, in bus business intelligence will be sort of maybe every row is a customer and every column would be sort of the purchase history um, of the customer. For example, if you have, you know, one of those VIP cards for either Harman's or Dan's grocery, uh, whenever they say they scan your ID, uh, one part of this is people start tracking what you have buy, what you have bought uh, and your purchase history and to get a sense of, you know, what to stock and what to put on sale. Right, so those are customer purchase histories. And that is another version of high dimensional data set. So the idea is to, if I have a high dimensional point cloud, I would like to um, get a sort of uh, a, a topological representation or summary of the point cloud. And you can use it for visualization and downstream analysis. Okay. And then in another way, um, you know, it's part of topological data analysis in a sense that it's part of the unsupervised uh, learning or exploratory data analysis. Okay, so there's a few very desirable property associated with the mapper algorithm. Um, one is it's sort of insensitive to the metric, which if you have something to, that approximates similarities between say each row of your data, that probably is okay. And it's also robust to small changes to the metric. The second thing is that, you know, um, it's help you understand the sensitivity of your topological summary with respect to changing a parameter, right? So in a sense that uh, as you see in the previous example, when computing a mapper graph, I have some parameter, one of them is an is a amount of uh, overlap of interval, one of them is number of intervals in the range space of the function. As you change that, you change sort of the resolution, you're looking at your high dimensional data set, um, and then you, you get a very different sort of summary of your data at different scale. Okay. And of course, you know, of course, this is also a sort of open question is how do you automatically find the parameters associated with the mapper construction. And um, um, so, so today we're going to talk about sort of motivation, high level intuition, but then we're going to dive into sort of the mathematical definition of the mapper construction. So Let's start with the simplest example. Of course, this example is much simpler than the example I showed before in terms of the activation vector from a neural network. Here, my data is just a circle, okay? That is my data. Um, and now, before I talk about the mapper construction, I would want to talk about a cover and a cover of sets, okay? So, so what I mean by that, remember a cover is sort of, I have a space and I have sort of, um, a space X and I sort of having, it belongs to a union of cover element, okay? And my first thing is to say, what about I want to cover it with three sets, okay? I'm going to try to picture the sets by a curve, right? So I can cover this circle by essentially three sets 
of curves, right? The top one is a curve. This is a curve B and there's a curve. Let me just use actually the color A and and then the C, it's a set, but it's a set containing two element, okay? So in a sense that right now, the, this particular example is that my, my circle is belongs to A union B union C, okay? And another way you think about it mentally is you can imagine, you know, my B set is roughly something looking like this. This is my B set. And this is my A set. And this is my C set. Okay. Of course, the way I drew it is kind of make it kind of messy looking, but you get an idea. All right, this is a cover. So now if I have a cover, right? Um, I mean, of course, those three cover you can also define by by their location in the in, on the two-dimensional screen. You kind of just define it as you know, point a collection of points. For example, for C, it's a collection of points uh, with the exception that I can, I don't allow, like I'm kind of breaking it up at those two locations. But anyway, so I now have a cover of my space, which is a circle. And then what we would like to do is to obtain an abstraction of the set relation based on overlap between them, okay? So in this case, I have A and B don't overlap because by definition, they are disjoint, right? A is a top part of the circle, also a bottom part of the circle, B is a top part of the circle, and C is sort of left and right hand side. But what's happening is, you know, C does overlap with both A and B, right? So what's going to happen is that if I kind of looking at the set relation between these two, I start thinking about, okay, maybe this middle one, the purple one is my set A, the top one is my set B. The bottom one is my set A. Okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to get rid of the color here to just reveal the actual color I try to use. So what I'm doing is for set C, I'm using it, representing it as a purple point. Set A is a red point, and set B is a blue point. And we know the set intersection between these two. So you know, if they have non-zero intersection, I'm going to put a line between them. Okay. So now with respect to a cover of my circle with those three sets, I get sort of a skeleton on the right, right hand side. Okay. So now let's think about, I'm going to, instead of representing the entire set C by a single point, right? Here I'm representing it by a single point. Instead, I'm going to split the set C by its connected component, right? C has two disjoint curves, so I'm going to split it into two. So that's why I have sort of those two components on the right-hand side highlighted by yellow. Those are the two connected components of this set. And now I'm gonna look at the overlap relation between C, the two connect component with C, let's call it the left-hand side, let's call this C1 and then this is C2. So this is C1, this is C2, the top is B, the bottom is A as usual. And I'm just going to look at the overlap between those, right? Because B is a single connected component, A is a single connected component. And we know that C1 intersect A and B, C2 intersect, you know, A and B, okay? So now I connect, again, connect them to represent their relations between the connected components, okay? So now what you see this sort of representative representation on the right hand side kind of represent my circle already, because in this case, you know, there's a loop also in this simple representation. So in a way that, you know, instead of needing an infinite number of points to represent my circle, right now I only need four points. Okay. But roughly speaking, what we just went through is a concept of a nerve. Okay. So what is nerve? Okay, so if, again, going back to the example of covering by circle, on the top, if I cover it by two sets, right, the left blue piece, the right yellow piece, 
Again, I'm going to each of those cover element. This is what my, the language I used before. I call them cover element. Each cover element become a point. And then if the cover element has a pairwise intersection, I have an edge between them. Now I have those two elements, right? They have a little bit overlap right here, right? There's a non-empty intersection, so there's an edge between them. Now, if I move from sort of two cover element to three cover element, again, the way I drew it is that there is a intersection at the sort of at the boundary of the cover element. Again, sort of the nerve in some way I'm obtaining has three cover element as points. And because they have a pairwise intersection, right, it, with respect to the underlying space, there is an edge between them. So it depends on how many cover elements I have and how those cover elements are arranged. I go from a summary of my circle from a line into a triangle. And of course, now what is happening in practice, right? This is ideal space where my space is just a circle itself. Well, in some sense, it's a manifold, right? A manifold is, again, if you are on the, on the, on the manifold locally, this looks like, locally, it looks like you're on a line, right? So this is a manifold, but you know, in practice, I don't have this ideal space. Most likely I have a point cloud sample of my space, but you can do a similar thing where you can cover this point cloud sample of underlying space by the cover element. Again, depend on how your cover element are arranged. Um, and you can look at sort of the intersection. Again, you know, if I have two cover element, there is an edge between them is because- uh, Can the, I ask one question? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so for the first graph, uh, there actually are two intersections yes. between the green and the yellow object. And yeah. uh, there is only one edge between them. Yes, so, because, yeah, go ahead. So, so it should, there should be two edges, I think, between those two elements. And it's not homotopic to this kind of one edge connection. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is question. a really interesting question. The classic mapper construction only care about whether there is intersection or not. So in this case, there is intersection, right? There is data point contained in the intersection. So there's an edge. There is a variant of mapper construction called Marty nerve. And that captures what you, exactly what you described, meaning that I'm not only looking at whether there is an inter, like whether there's data point in the intersection of the cover element, but how many components are there in the intersection. So in the Marty nerve, setting it's going to try to put two but right now i'm talking about the classic version so the classic version only care about whether there's intersection or not does I that make see. sense so that can only be at the most one edge between two elements right yes yes I agree. Thank in the you. classic setting yeah all right so now again you you have a point cloud sample right this is my data right this is my high dimensional data even though all my pictures in 2d but imagine each of those points can be a high dimensional point now i have some sort of cover and i'm going to take you know each of the cover element to be a point and then there is not empty intersection between the you know like between the cover element in terms of my data then there's an edge between them All right, so of course I can go from three cover element to four cover element and so on. All right. So the idea of a nerve, we have not really moving to the mapper construction exactly. We're just talking about covering of a space, okay? So there is a document is if I want to recover sort of my underlying space to be a point cloud sample from a circle, if I want to sort of recover that circle, recover that loop, or recover that tunnel, what is the right number of cover element? And how do those cover elements are arranged with one another? So in a sense that you want to, you're giving a point cloud, you want to think about what is the right cover, okay? So in some sense, though, both examples I show in this picture is that, you know, I kind of choose the right scale, right? Even though I vary from three cover element to four cover element, but either way, I'm capturing that loop, right? So usually there is going to be a range of scales where it works well to capture, capture the underlying shape of the data, okay? So again, this, like I said, this is a very sort of active research area is like can automatically find that scale, okay? So- hey, There's a question. 
yeah. in chat. So Mitchell asked, did the covering set for the circle have to be open intervals? If that, is that why they were just missing endpoints? I'm not sure what it means. Oh, yeah. So, so right now, when we talk about cover, we always talk about sort of open, um, open intervals. Right. Right now, we always talk about open intervals for the time being. Yeah. All right. So, what is the strength? Right now, you see this sort of idea of a cover. Let's go back to the mapper algorithm. There's a few things. The, the the first one is data summarization and skeletonization, which means that I would like to get some form of representation of my data in the form of simplicial complex or graphs, right? So the graph is basically the one dimensional skeleton of my mapper construction, uh, but my mapper construction can have triangles if I have a three way intersection of my cover element with respect to the underlying data. The second thing is that how do I get to that cover? And in the mapper framework, it's in some sense a function induced right, covering or a function induced clustering. So the reason why this whole you know, lecture is grouped surrounding the idea of clustering is you can also imagine mapper is a fancier way of doing clustering where you are doing some sort of fuzzy clustering of the data and that clustering is guided by a function defined on the data set. It's flexible because if I go back to say, okay, I have say three cover element, how do I decide those three cover element form like a single component is because I'm just applying some sort of clustering to each of the point cloud. It's going to give me that there's one cluster. Let's say I'm using DB scan. This is where DB scan comes back. As we reviewed DB scan last lecture, DB scan is a very commonly used subroutine inside mapper algorithm to compute clustering. Right. And of course, last bit of it is exploratory and it's multi scale. Okay. So, what is the mass behind mapper? So, the first thing we're going to see is what's called a mapper, uh, sorry, a reb graph. This is sort of the ideal scenario where, let's say, my space X is a topological space and topological space as we defined before. But, you know, in some sense, this is a common way of thinking about this top example of this topological space X can be a manifold. Okay. So let's say my space here is a manifold and a very classic manifold is a surface of a donut, which is called a torus, okay? So now I have an example of a torus and the height function, it has to be continuous, okay? So I'm, I have a torus defined and I, my function defined on it is a height function. So I kind of having sort of think about, I put the donut, but I put it on the desk and it's kind of sit on my desk, okay? Where you can see that tunnel. And now you have a height function defined on it in this particular example. The idea, the first thing to define reef graph is to define what's called equivalent relations, equivalence relations. So two point on the surface of my manifold, or in this case, any topological space is considered equivalent. And we kind of use the notation equivalent for under two conditions, one, if they have the same function value, and two, if they belong to the same past kinetic component of the pre-image of, of the function. Okay, this is of course the mathematical definition. What do I mean by that? As I mentioned before, I have a height function. Let's say this is my height function defined on my torus. If I pick a height value, let's say I pick a height value of A, what I drew here, let's say here, this is F inverse of A. Okay, what is F inverse of A? That's what's called a pre-image, right? It's all the points in the domain, which is on the surface of my torus that has height value. So again, if what is this? You take the, you take the donut, you put it on the table, you take a, a knife and you kind of slice a piece of it, right, at a particular height. And on the boundary of that piece, that's exactly F inverse of A, right? I mean, the direct translation is those are all the points on my space that has this height value. Now, what is equivalence relation? If I take this piece out, because it's a torus, so it's actually hollow, 
this is f inverse of a, right? It's basically a loop on the surface of my torus at this height. And we say that there's two points on it. Those two points, any two points on this is considered equivalent. Why? Number one, they have the same height value. Two, they be belong to the same component, right? When I say pass connected component, that means there's a pass that connect those going from one point to another. They can, they are reachable from one another. Okay, so that is equivalence relation. Now, if I choose, say, this height value right here, my height value B, and let's say this is exactly where F inverse of B looks like, okay? Because now I'm actually at where the sort of the tunnel is. If I take F inverse, my F inverse of B actually contains two loops now, right? Again, you are kind of cut the donut right across the hole you see two boundary circles on each side, right? So I now have two pass connect component. And what happened is that if I have a point on the left-hand side and a point on the right-hand side, let's say X and Y, they are not equivalent to each other because I cannot go from one point to another, okay? So that is the definition of equivalence relation, right? If I take an inverse of a particular function value, I look at all the points in my domain of my function and to see whether they are forming in the same component or not, okay? And now read graph is this quotient space. What do I mean quotient space? Okay, this intuitively this quotient operation is to say, I'm going to identify all the points that is considered to be equivalent into a single point. That's really what is a quotient operation really means. When you quotient something based on some equivalence relation is to say, I'm going to treat them as if they are equivalent to each other. Therefore, I can kind of shrink them to a single point. So what do I get by doing that? Okay. So what I get by doing that is at the A, if I look at the inverse map, there's one single connected component because everybody on that single connected component, which is this curve, right? This curve, everybody who are on it are equivalent to each other. So I'm going to shrink that to a single point. So this is a point, okay? Now, if I'm looking at the level at B, because I have two loops, so all the points that belongs to the left loop, they are all equivalent to each other. I shrink that to one point. All the points on the right loop belongs to each other, right? They, they are equivalent to each other. I shrink that to a point that is the right point, okay? So what do I happen if, let's say if I start from the top down, right? At the very top is a local maximum, the, the sort of the level set, which is sometimes also called a contour, is a single point. As I go down, you know, I have a single point and a loop and a loop and a loop and a loop. And all this part is a single loop. So you kind of have a sequence of points glued together until you reach this point. And this point, let's call this point P. This point P is what's called a saddle point, right? It's called a saddle because locally, there's two directions that goes up and two directions that come down. It's actually an upside down saddle in the traditional sense. But once you pass through that saddle point, all of a sudden the level set or the contour split into two loops, okay? So that's why you have those two loops and so on. So as you go along, right, you get this, when you do this quotient, you start getting a skeleton of my space by shrinking points that are equivalent to each other into a single point. And at the end of the day, I get the entire sort of representation on the right-hand side. And that's my rib graph. Of course, the arrow in the rib graph is just showing the increasing in function value, okay? So that is a rib graph, okay? The rib graph is basically saying that I'm going to get, if I have a space and I have a continuous function on this space, I'm going to define some form of equivalence relation. And based on that equivalence relation, I'm going to shrink all the points that are equivalent to each other into a single point. And I'm going to glue those points all together that give rise to a graph representation of my underlying space coupled with that function. So the important part of the rib space is actually, it's a rib, oh, sorry, rib graph. It's, it's a graph constructed over a pair, right? The pair is defined by the space and a function on the space. Okay, so given this pair, I'm going to get a summary 
of, uh, of the data. But you can imagine if I change my function f to some other function, I'm going to get a different summary of my data. Okay, any questions so far? All right, now, where does this arise, for example, in applications? You can apply this in shape analysis, right? This is a classic application. In this case, you have some sort of 3D model. And again, I'm going to use a simple function on this 3D model, right? This is my 3D model is my space X. And my function is again, my height function. It goes from purple to red, going from the minimum to maximum. Another function you can do is, for example, curvature, okay? You can do a curvature in this particular case as well. But the idea is once you have this height function roughly, um, you can actually now get a summary, a skeleton summary. For example, let's say look at the happy Buddha or David, okay? So David has, the, let's say happy Buddha. Happy Buddha is quite complicated because it has all those loops. And then what you see on the right hand side is a rib graph of the space using the height function. And then what you see is you can actually see sort of loops here that's corresponding to where the hand and, uh, you know, and the head is forming. And then of course there is, you know, loops on here and here that corresponding to loops here and here that corresponding to um, sort of, you know, the formation of the clothes and then the body, right? So in your sense that you can kind of capture a skeleton of the shape, even though it's a very rough skeleton, but it's nevertheless, you know, a representation of the shape in a skeleton form. Okay, so as I mentioned, let me emphasize, when you compute a rib graph, what sort of data? The data is always a topological space X coupled with a function on the space. Of course, in practice, the space X is usually a point cloud sample of the underlying space, okay? So you have a space with a function. And again, I'm drawing a picture of a height function, okay? In fact, let's see height function. And the right-hand side is the rib graph, okay? Again, what's happening if I choose, say, this height value A, I take the inverse, you see there's two loops. This is F inverse of A. And correspondingly, each of those loops shrink to two points, okay? Same thing here. If I choose, say, a height value here, let's say this is my value B, this correspond to, in some sense, three loops. Let me just draw it. Right, there are three loops. And this each of those three loops is a connected component that corresponding to three points in my rib graph. So you can kind of scan, let's say I do it from bottom up, I can scan my function value and then kind of shrink those level sets to a single point. And then that is my rib graph. And of course, in this slide, I'm going to use the, the G of X to represent it's a graph. But you, know, you can use other notations also. But another thing is that when I'm doing this, I'm also inherently carry over some function value on it, specifically the function value at the critical point. So what are the critical points here? There is a local maximum of my function. There's local minimum of my function. And then there is all those saddle points, which I'm going to use red point. Yeah, one of the interesting component in here is that those saddle point get preserved in my construction of my skeleton. And of course, my local maximum is also preserved. Let me use actually a different color to represent local maximum. So those are local maximum. And of course, my local minimum is preserved, okay? So there's some interesting property of the rib, rib graph in a sense that once when I'm getting the skeleton, I'm preserving the loop of my underlying space in this particular case. I'm also preserving sort of the location of my critical points, specifically how are those critical points related to each other, all right? 
Okay, when I say critical point, what do I mean by that? Um, I hope I have a slice later, but if I have a function, right, from one space to another, to R, it, let's say it's a scalar function, the critical point are the places where my gradient is equal to zero, right? So if you take the gradient of this, this is equal to zero, but there's a whole series of what's called more series, which put a bit of an additional requirement to say not only they are uh, they, they have a zero gradient, but also I'm going to assume things are isolated. So what do I mean by that? When I say isolated, that means those critical points sort of they are not, um, you know, there is a small neighborhood that only contain the critical points. Okay. So meaning that I don't allow a flat surface. Let's say I have a flat surface and I have a height function on the flat surface, then almost everybody on this flat surface is critical, but they're not isolated because they are sort of like every, because every single point is critical, okay? So there's a, some isolation. And also for sort of convenience, you can also say if I have critical point P and any two critical point that their function value is not the same. So in a way that I can perturb the function value at the critical points a little bit, so that they always have a unique function value. That's another thing that's for convenience. Okay, so this is my rib graph, okay? My rib graph captures, in some sense, the shape of my data, but of course it throw away some other information. For example, one thing I throw away is a curvature, right? I don't know what is a curvature in the, for example, surrounding point P, you know, there's some sort of curvature associated with that area, but I completely ignore the fact. This is a topological skeleton. I only care about what is the relation between my critical points, okay? How they're connected to each other. So once they might connected to each other is what is a contour, in some sense, the contour, which is F inverse of A, how are the contours related to each other, right? So essentially remember, I'm always shrinking a component from the contour into a single point. So now let's get back to the definition of a cover. Now you know, you know, kind of intuitively what a cover looks like. Now let's define a cover. Again, when I say open cover, I mean the cover has to be open. Remember we described earlier on this semester what is an open set. So ideally when you cover things with interval, the interval are open, right? When you cover it with say rectangle, the rectangle don't include its boundary. But in the high level, right? If I have a topological space X, uh, open cover of it is again a collection of set. I mean, A is just an index such that the space actually, this is a typo, should be a subset of the union of it. Okay. And now, if I have a cover of the space, the nerve, okay, of this cover is the simplicial complex, okay, that corresponding to the nerve of the cover where the mathematic notation is to say that a simplex sigma, sigma now represents a sig simplex, a sigma, sim simplex is in the simplicial complex if all the points, in this case, cover element that is part of the simplex is have non-empty intersection, okay? So what does this mean? I have three element, u1, u2, u3, where my x is a subset of the u1 union, u2 union, u3, okay? And I say, well, there is an element, which is, this is my sigma, which is an edge, is part of my nerve. If the corresponding element, which in this case is u1, u3, if the corresponding element has non empty intersection, which is true. So I put a, so I put essentially another way to think about this. This is essentially the check complex of those cover element, meaning that if I have a pairwise intersection, I put an edge. If I have a three way intersection, I'm going to put a triangle. All right. So that's what it is, is that if I have a cover element, for example, um, let me just add a, one more example, right? Remember, we go back to the example of um, sensor network, right? 
Remember, if I have sensor one, this is a carbon element from the first sensor. This is a carbon element of a second sensor, and this is a carbon element of the third sensor, right? It's kind of cover some underlying space, but in this case, the disk U1, U2, and the disks are my cover element. If I want to get the nerve of this, remember there is an edge. If there's a not pairwise non-empty intersection, so there is pairwise non-empty um, non intersection between U1, U2, U1, U3, and U2, U3. So there's three edges. But also in addition, there is a triangle in here because I have three-way intersection. So that is sort of the nerve, okay? Now, what does mapper do? So one thing you have seen in the topo act framework is that I am using sort of a function which is a scalar function defined on my underlying space. But ideally the mapper construction is not constrained to scalar value, okay? But it's easier for the rest of my lecture today, I'm assuming D is equal to one. So my function is a real valued function or a scalar function, okay? But later on, we can talk about if my function is sort of mapped into R2, okay? But the definition of it is that you have a function on the space and the function can be a high dimensional function not a high, so my, remember there's two things. My point cloud can be high dimensional, but my function can be high dimensional. Or if I want to differentiate, let me call this a multivariate function, right? So you have multiple dimensions of the, there's multiple sort of dimension associated with a function also. Now, everything I wrote in this slide is very mathematical. Let's get to the example really, okay? So what is the input? You have a point cloud, for the mapper construction, right? I mean, in the ideal scenario, X is my topological space, but in practice, it's a point cloud. And then I have a distance measure between any two points in my point cloud. So remember, going back to say the, the let's say the, the, the consumer record data set, let's say each row is a customer and, and each, each, each column is a purchase history. You know, say I bought, uh, I don't know, two pounds of beef at uh, $5.99 a pound, right? And on this date, that, that would be my purchase history for one item, okay? Uh, let's say that each, each row is a customer and then each of the columns collect the purchase history. Now there is this obvious question is, what is the distance between row one and row two? How do I measure two customer have the similar purchase history, okay? Of course, let's say, let's simplify it so that, you know, let's say two people bought uh, a very similar sets of item, but you know maybe I you know most of the item is the same except I bought banana and the other person bought apple. Okay, so maybe the distance between my purchase history, if I only care about the type of item I bought, will be some sort of edit distance. So what is edit distance, right? If you think about edit distance, it happens a lot when you are talking about distances between strings of letters. Uh, an edit distance is to say how much manipulation over the letter can I, do I have to make to make this two string look the same, right? So for example, if I have a string that is A, B, A, A, B, and another string is A, B, A, B, B, then I will say the edit distance between these two is sort of one because I only need to change this to A to make two of them equal, right? So one distance can point cloud and for any two points, I can measure some distance. And then the, and then the last one is I have a function on this point cloud, right? Remember the previous example, I have a height function, but of course you have other vari variation of the function in, the in terms of shapes, you can be curvature. Okay. So now the output, you know, I mean, it can be a simplicial complex, but for the time being, I'm going to look at the skeleton of it, which is one dimensional skeleton, which I only care about pairwise. So I'm going to try to use either, it's a summary of what I call mapper graph, or sometimes I call a mapper construction when it's a simplicial complex, okay? So the output, let's for the simplicity of explanation, let's say right now I only care about the one dimensional skeleton, which is a graph, okay? And then once you have this graph, you can play with 
with this graph, you can look at oh, what data point belongs to node of the graph and what statistic can I have performed on top of those nodes. Okay. And then, of course, when I go back to it, what are the parameters? There is a parameter for once I see the points belong to a particular cover element, how do I cluster them? What type of filter function I'm going to choose? The number of interval, the amount of overlap. And of course, for visualization, there's other parameters that, such as how do I color my point in the visualization interface? Okay. This is all sounds abstract. Let's look at the most classic example of a mapper algorithm, which is I have a point cloud sample from a circle. We kind of have seen this before, but this is let's go over this example more carefully. I have my point cloud X and I have my height function on it. And the height goes from blue to red, from the lowest height to highest height. And then in order to get a cover of this loop, I'm going to start from the range of the function. So I kind of derive in this case, I'm going to choose five intervals, okay? Such that they cover this real line. And then the cover element of my data is, so let's say this is U1, U2, U3, U4, U5. And then in order for me to get to a cover element of my domain, which is my circle, I'm going to look at the inverse map of each of those cover element, inverse map, okay? So for example, if I focus on the top one, let me use a color red, okay? Let's say I'm looking at this is U1. Then everything I just drew here, they are literally separated. Those are the points whose function value falls within this interval, okay? So if I go back to here, those are all the points that is in this, that is part of this circle that I drew, meaning that all the points has a function value that is in that range. If I look at U3, let's say U3, again, I look at the inverse map of U3, there is actually all this point here versus all this point here are belongs to that function value interval, okay? But of course, now I'm going to have to apply some sort of clustering. Let's say I'm using DB scan, which is a density-based. The density-based one is going to give me two um, sort of components that be become two points in my mapper graph and so on, okay? But first of all, let's go into detail, right? So I have a point cloud, I have a filter function, and in this case, it's the filter functions are the function on the point cloud is sometimes called a filter function. In this case, we're using a height function. And then there's some sort of distance between the points. And then the, right now we're just using Euclidean distance. That's step one. Step two, I'm going to cover the range of the function with interval. Okay, so in this case, like I said, the number of interval is there's five interval. And also I say they overlap roughly 25%. So when I say 25%, that means this interval, the green interval and the red interval, the overlap roughly 25% of the total length. All right, so that is step two. Okay. Now the next step is to say, look at, in, look at the point in the domain that falls into each interval and apply clustering to those points. So the clustering we're going to use right now is based on density, so db scan. And then, um, so we kind of, again, let me look at one of those interval, let's say u3 is the interval. And then the points that I drew on the left-hand side, those are the points from my domain of my point cloud that has function value that falls into this interval. And when I apply db scan, it's going to give me two cluster, okay? So because of this, whenever I'm looking at the inverse map of those interval, it's going to and apply my DB scan. What is my covering or what is my cover element? My cover element correspond to the points who belongs to the same cluster. So in a sense that on the top for the first interval U1, I get one cluster. So that's one cover element with U2, I get two cluster, so I get two element. Remember the picture I'm drawing right now, I'm already intentionally separated those points. So, but you know that those points because of interval overlap, correspondingly, they're most likely will be overlap in the cover elements. 
Um, and then I'm going to obtain the nerve of this cover element. So if I actually drew it, you know, not in the separated way, if I drew it in the ideal scenario, what I have is I actually have a point cloud like this and I have the green cover element. I have the two pieces of red cover element. Let me use a different color. There's two elements in the inverse map. Let's see again, and the last one. This is what it really looks like in the original space when I take the inverse map. And then correspondingly, once you, when you can comp compute the nerve of those cover, again, remember the rule is that when there's pairwise intersection of the underlying point cloud, there is an edge. If there's three-way intersection, there's a triangle and so on and so forth. But right now I'm just looking at the one dimensional skeleton, meaning that I only care about the edge edges, right? So I get a mapper graph as I watch you on the right-hand side, okay? And the last bit is that, okay, now given this, I have a summary of my point cloud as sort of like now there's sort of a graph contains eight nodes and a number of edges connecting them. I know that I have captured this loop, but what else can I do down, down, down the road is that remember each node here is a cluster of points from my data set. So you can actually now do things like machine learning on this subset of points. For example, you can do linear regression, uh, you can do a sort of visualization and so on and so forth, right? So on the high level, a mapper algorithm is a function induced clustering. So ultimately every single node in my mapper graph is a cluster. The only difference between mapper algorithm and the sort of like say k-means clustering is, is sort of like a fuzzy clustering in a way that because you know those clusters partially overlap. So you can not only look at what are the clusters, but what the relation between the clusters, which is captured by the edges. Okay, so that is sort of the high level overview of how mapper algorithm falls into the general framework of clustering. You know, it's not only captured what are in the clusters, but what's the relation between clusters or what the connectivity between clusters. That's where the topology comes in, is, is looking at the relations among different clusters. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. The U1 through U5, the intervals, yeah. were they manually defined by the user or did Mapper figure out those intervals? No, 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 you define by the user. This is one of the, one of the parameters uh, people do. And the classic ones people like to do like um, where the number of interval, the interval to be of uniform length, right? So there's really two parameters in this. One is the number of interval and the percentage of overlap, right? Okay. Yeah. It is user defined. Of course, the really interesting open question, which I think there has been some recent theoretical result, is how do you try to find those parameter uh, sort of uh, automatically, mm -hmm. right? Because I mean, of course, this is a sort of uh, interesting question. Um, if I want to recover sort of the topological summary of my loop, right? Ideally, I want enough cover element such that my skeleton contains a loop, right? Right. So, so, so what do I do is that we know that there's a range of those parameters where all of them can capture the loop. For example, in this case, I'm using five intervals, but actually I, what I could do is I could actually only need maybe three intervals, right? Say this is my point cloud and I probably only need three intervals. Like this is a first interval. This is a second interval. This is a third interval. Because if I just use the three intervals, right? What do I get? The inverse of the red interval, are all the points in here, the inverse of the blue interval, oh sorry, green interval are here and the inverse of blue interval are here. So if I just have in the three intervals, there is a cluster, of course, assuming it's very dense, okay? There's a cluster here there's a two cluster and then the last cluster. And then of course there is intersection between the underlying point cloud. 
right? So in this case, if I just have three intervals and have them positioned the way I did, I can also get a skeleton that preserves that loop. I don't need five intervals, right? So mm -hmm. one of the sort of rough idea of people trying to automatically, you know, try to find the, the range of interval where it's useful is you go from say, uh, you kind of slowly increase the number of intervals and to see how does the topology change. For example, as I mentioned before, if I actually just have two intervals like this, then the topological skeleton for two intervals is just a line, right? So going from two interval to three interval, there's a drastic change over the underlying topology. It went from there's no loop to having a loop, right? So one of those idea of trying to automatically tune the parameters is to look at the underlying topological change of the skeleton. If there's a drastic change, that means something interesting happened between the previous set of parameter and the current set of parameter. Okay, I mean, doing the sort of exploratory things, is it always like a linear division of the intervals or can you do something like one interval is really small and- Yes, you can also do adaptive, in fact, um, some of those open source implementation include uh, uh, adaptive uh, intervals where the, the length of the interval is sort of related to the density of my points. So for example, if I have a point cloud, right, of course, I'm going to try to do sort of not uniform density, right? So for example, this might be my point cloud where around here, there's a really dense dense uh, things. So maybe one rule is my interval, the inverse map have roughly same number of points. So in this case, if I'm doing density adaptive interval, then I can have very small, tiny intervals in area that is very dense, and then maybe long intervals in area that is not very dense. Okay, So there's density adaptive intervals as well. Okay. Yeah. But, of, but of course, for simplicity, uh, it's easier to have the uniform length and so on. But, you know, but there's always the argument why you want a density adaptive things is maybe you want to pick up, you know, certain areas, maybe a very coarse interval is going to ignore, right? For example, uh, let's, let, let's do like, you know, remember I have a snowman, right? At some point I have a snowman picture and the snowman has like fingers. Right. So basically, if I want to, okay, this is a little bit creepy picture, but if I want to pick up the fingers of the snowman, I need a very tiny interval around there to be able to pick up those branches. But instead, if I have a really large interval right here, if I take the inverse map, this is in my inverse map, it just tell me there's a hand, but I will not be able to recover the fingers. Right. So in a sense that those interval has a lot to do with what is the resolution, you also want to pick out local. So, okay, very good question. Hey, should we take a short break? I didn't want to- Oh yeah, sorry, I just before. went all the way. Let's take a short break uh, for five minutes. We'll come back at 10.10. 10. Thank you for reminding me. I mean, I kind of just went straight up. So five minutes break.
All right, let's let's resume. For some reason, I can no longer see the video. Sorry, just a second. Right here, great. Okay, all right, so uh, thanks Faye for reminding me to take a break. Um, so there's some details algorithm way from, um, you know, when I take the inverse map of a uh, interval, right, I get a sort of a point cloud. Um, what sort of clustering algorithm can be used? The answer is almost or, but some of them works better than others. For example, as I mentioned before, if I take the inverse map of say the green element, the green uh, interval, I get all the points, the crosses that's in green, okay? So the classic one would be using things like DB scan because it's density based and it does not need to specify ahead of time how many clusters do you have. So if I run a density based clustering, then it's going to tell me there's two clusters. But of course you can use things like K means clustering, right? But the problem is you have to specify K. If I tell it to say, oh, K is equal to three, then it's going to force it to have three clusters, which in fact, it probably is better to just have two. Right. So, and, and of course, another clustering algorithm you can use is things like single linkage, right? Single linkage clustering is to say, I'm going to collapse points which are closest to me first. And I kind of doing that. So there's a little bit flavor of a density based things as well. And also single linkage, you know, of course, single linkage has a has one additional parameter where you want to decide on which level you stop the process itself. So in single linkage, you would have to look for the gaps in pairwise distances, right? In a way that if I drew what they call the dendrogram of a single linkage, I have data point this two, they are merged together because they are very close to each other. You know, those two, they're close to each other and so on and so forth. So you can imagine on the left-hand side, there are a bunch of points who are kind of merged in a single linkage clustering on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. And then in order for two of those cluster to merge, they need a very large pairwise distances to merge the left and the right cluster together. So for single linkage, I could probably choose a threshold right here to separate those two clusters, right? So it depends on which clustering algorithm you use, you are going to get a slightly different results, but the framework is very flexible in a sense that almost all clustering algorithm can be applied. The second thing is that, you know, assuming there's a notion of distance between their pair, pair points, you can either provide the pairwise distances or compute the pairwise distances. And of course, the pairwise distances between the points do not have to be a Euclidean, right? Like I said before, it can be edit distance. As long as it's a distance metric, it's fine. So how does this notion of this algorithm, which applies on point cloud, connect back to the ideal space of my read graph? is in a sense, the clustering operation I'm doing here is equivalent to the operation I did for the ideal space where I'm looking at connected components, right? So in a sense that the clusters are sort of a data perspective over the topological notion of connected components. Um, so as I mentioned before, there's DB scan, single linkage, k-means can be used as a clustering algorithm. Um, it's not restricted to Euclidean distances. And sometimes you can even provide a pairwise distance metric if you don't want to compute. In fact, in certain scenario, it's advisable to provide the pairwise distances ahead of time so that each time you run the clustering, you don't have to recompute the pairwise distances. Because if I'm thinking about more scalable computation, maybe I want to put, you know, pay an initial price to compute all pairwise distances or maybe only a subset of pairwise distances for points are very close to each other. But later on, when I run the clustering algorithm, I do not have to uh, recompute those distances, which can be costly, especially when your points are higher dimensions, okay? Um, so those are some of the properties. And then there's parameters, as I've mentioned before, there's a number of interval and percentage of overlap. I mean, all this parameter is one have a scalar function, okay? But ideally, um, so the, the typical observation, right? Those are not theorems, those are just observations. If I, typically if I increase the number of intervals, I'm gonna increase the number of clusters we're gonna get, right? Because I'm going to get, you know, all the points that belongs to smaller, smaller intervals. And 
Of course, if my points are not very uniform sampled, we may get some empty clusters, right? When, when you have a small number of points per cluster, and if you use things like dbscan, remember, um, uh, dbscan actually throw away some outliers, right? Some points may not be even become part of any cluster. Uh, and also another typical trend is as you increase the number of intervals, and of course, you know, the interval becomes shorter and uh, shorter, you are going to get some more fine feature of the data, which is my example of the finger of the snowman, right? And of course, if my density varies, uh, we are going to, if, if my density vary and if my interval are not adaptive to the density, if I just use uniform intervals, then I'm typically going to pick up cluster with a high density. Um, percentage of overlap, again, if I increase the percentage of overlap, say, let's say this amount of percentage over this amount of percentage of overlap of the intervals, I'm going to kind of sort of impose more relations between the clusters, right? And, and sometimes it can be robust to dealing with noise um, to increase the percentage of overlap a bit. Of course, on the other extreme, if I have really tiny amount of overlap, like this much, right, then you might have, you might get a very disconnected representation of your data. If you are, you know, sort of your density is sort of, um, is rather uh, small, oh, sorry, you have a very small density, then you might get disconnected uh, pieces of your mapogram. Filter function, as I mentioned before, I have been using height function as a filter function. There's other ways, right? If I provide a prior knowledge of my point cloud, let's say my point cloud is a purchase history of car, and I'm going to choose a filter function as the price of my car, right? So each point is a purchase history of a car, but the filter function is a purchasing price. Then what am I doing? My mapper graph is trying to capture, oh, what are the shared properties of people who purchased, um, you know, high price range cars, right? You know, and, and so on. So you can, you can, the user can provide a particular uh, filter function. In the ideal scenario, the, this filter function, you know, has to be roughly drawn from a continuous function. Um, the other type of function, filter function, right, can be used to derive from the point cloud itself. One of them is density. So if I just have a high dimensional point cloud, what sort of filter function do I want to use? Remember in topo act, we use L2 norm, right? Which is the length of each of the high dimensional vector, but I can also do things like density. So a density of a point is a sum of all over other points over some exponential. So this is just one example of a density. Okay, and then the density is, you know, inversely proportional to the pairwise distances. There's also the idea of eccentricity, which is basically on the high level capture how central this point is with respect to the point cloud. If the point, if this point is very central, right, in a way that, you know, from a graph theory perspective is that for any other two points in the neighborhood, in order to travel from one point to another, it has to go through this point. Then this is a very central point. And then, then it will have a sort of high function value. Um, and also you can use things like graph Laplacian. And also like, if I just have a weird shape like this, if this is my shape, right? Let's say the shape is a snake. Instead of using height function, I can say, you know, I'm just do a snake. I can do the distance to the head of the snake or the distance to the tail. Let's say I do the distance to the tail. Then every single point, say here, the scalar function defined on this space is the distance, intrinsic distance to its tail, okay? So now if I do the distance to the point in the data, it's sort of in my especially intrinsic distance, it capture more of the intrinsic property of my data, okay? So there's different variations of how you choose this filter function. And again, remember, even if I have the same point cloud, if I change which filter function I'm gonna use, I'm gonna get a likely a very different summary, okay? So now let me move on from rib graph to rib space. This goes from sort of scalar function to what I call multivariate function. The major difference is right here where my D is bigger or equal to two. So what does that mean? 
I have, for example, a point cloud and I have two scalar function defined on it. So let's say if I have f from x to r2, then I can also write it as if it's equal to f1 and f2. Okay. It's, 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 oh, sorry. Okay, I want to do this. What does this mean? This means maybe my first function is temperature, my second function is pressure, right? So basically you have a domain, but you have multiple observations on the domain. So you have multiple scalar function, which in this case, I'm going to call it multivariate function. Now I can do the exactly same thing, except the ending result, what I have is instead of called a rib graph, it's called a rib space. Again, I'm going to define a equivalence between two points. You know, they're equivalent if their function value is the same. And if they belong to the same past kind of component, the only thing is that remember in the previously A is a point in R, right? It's a real value. Now A, for example, if D is equal to two is a point, it's a vector, right? So two points are equivalent if their function values are same when their vector match to each other, okay? And everything else is the same. So now if you do this, you get again, a topological skeleton. Again, I'm going to define the quotient operations. So again, all the points were decided to be equivalent to each other. You have to kind of uh, shrink it uh, to a point. But what you get is something called a rib space. So think about rib space as a high dimensional version of rib graph. Now, let's say I'm going from, again, from one dimensional function to two or multivariate or bivariate function in this case. Remember in the previous scenario, my initial way to derive my cover element is I have intervals on the real line. Now my range of my function is now a plane. So what is my cover element? It can be rectangles, right? So I have sort of overlapping rectangles as my, as my, um, as my cover of the range of my function. Again, this is u1, u2, u3. And then you are looking at the inverse map of them, f inverse u1, ui, to be cover element of my domain, OK? Of course, they don't have to be rectangles. They can be other sort of shapes. But the typical shape you know, that is recommended is a sort of convex shape. Uh, a shape is convex when any two points in the shape can be reached by a straight line, uh, any straight line connection between them is part of that shape, okay? So for example, this is a convex shape. So you go from what's called one dimensional interval to two dimensional interval or basically rectangles, okay? And then you take the inverse of those rectangles and everything else is the same, okay? So in practice, though, when you're using mapper algorithm to study sort of the point cloud and getting summary, the most likely scenario is you have a scalar function or you have a bivariate function. It's pretty rare for you to apply to mapper construction in higher dimensions or higher or like, you know, with three variables, for example, because now if you go to three variables, what is your cover element? cubes, okay. right? You are, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. It was just saying the same thing. Yeah, okay. Something so, in 3D. Yeah, so you're going to take inverse. In this case, you're taking inverse of a rectangle. In 3D, you're going to take inverse of a cube, right? So things become a little bit more complicated when you go higher dimensions. But here's how it looks like when you have two dimensions, two filter function you have a sphere, okay? And you have a height function G going from bottom to top. And then the correspondingly, you see pictures. Those are sort of the inverse map of this. And then you have another function F going from left to right, right? So again, it's a height going from left to right. And again, the corresponding intervals looking like this. Okay, the inverse map of the intervals. 
And now what I'm going to do is, okay, I have these two functions. One goes from bottom to top, one goes from left to right. I'm going to look at the um, range of the function and cover it by rectangles, okay? Now I'm going to choose any of those rectangles here. Let's say I'm going to choose this rectangle. And now what I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at the part of my point in my domain so that it's function value with respect to function value in G falls into this range. And then the function value of with respect to, let me just redo it, F falls into this range, right? So I kind of take the rectangle and then project it into X axis or project it into Y axis. So now I'm going to constrain my data point to belong to both ranges, right? So what that do, this particular one, it's returning the number of connected components on the right picture. It says, let's say the one that I'm focused on is this one, okay? It says two, why? Because it's a sphere and I'm looking at a patches of it. And if I see it clearly, this is one of those patch that falls into those two ranges where on the sort of Y axis, it falls into a particular range with respect to function G. On the X axis, it falls into a particular range with respect to function F. And because it's a sphere, there's actually two patches of my data that both falls into this range. So that's why it's returning two because there's a front patch, there's a back patch. Another way to really picture this visually is that essentially every single interval for a single function give me those ribbons right of my domain and then pretty much to decide on the intersection i'm intersecting those ribbons of functional range and we're looking at how many intersections those ribbons have with respect to one another okay so this is a high dimensional scenario we we just went from two-dimensional rib space to two-dimensional mapper and then the difference is that basically, instead of having one filter function, I have two filter function. Okay, what are some other applications? We've seen some application in Topo Act. There's applications, like I said, for data skeletonization and classification. In this case, I have, like I said, I have the elephant and then the elephant is in different posture. Okay, one is standing, one is dancing. And then my function I define on this Anything is a curvature function. So the curvature means that the tip of the nose has a and has a pretty uh, high curvature, for example, right? So basically, as the interesting thing is that if I define a filter function on the shape, well, that filter function do not change intrinsically. For example, curvature, right? Like if, if my finger has high curvature, if my finger goes to this versus this, the, the curvature estimation over the tip of my finger doesn't change. So in a sense that yeah, you can get a shape skeleton that is sort of invariant to kind of a small morph of the shape, okay? So this works better than say a height function. And you can use this to do shape classification. The other sort of more classic example, again, is you can study this by studying uh, breast cancer patients. Right, so again, what you see picture here is uh, sort of uh, the clustering of the patient. So every single node here is a cluster of patients. And you can look at, for example, based on their survival rate, um, and you can sort of study their genetic profiles and look at sort of subpopulation of cancer patients. And specifically, they're looking at, again, bifurcations in the mapper graph, so that you can look at sort of how different populations of the patient differ with respect to their uh, genetic profile and what is that effect over their survival rate. Uh, there's also, again, you know, this is another example of breast cancer data set. And then again, all those different area of my mapper graph correspond to different subpopulations. Uh, there's also politics. You can map the data um, into, uh, from sort of people's voting pattern. You know, for example, the, the Senate or the House uh, each of those Senate uh, or, or the representatives have their voting record over they voted yes or no or sustain over a particular issue. And let's say if they voted 300 different issues over the year, then it's a 300 dimensional point. And you can look at sort of the clustering of those data set 
uh, based on their voting behavior. So pretty much you can apply a mapper algorithm because inherently it's a clustering algorithm. You can apply the clustering on a lot of high dimensional data set, but the only major difference, as I want to emphasize, is function induced, meaning that as you change what filter function you use, you're going to get a different type of summary of your data. Uh, there's also people looking at sports, right? This is sort of the, uh, the, the, the record of people in an uh, um, NBA team of what different roles um, they have played, whether they are guard, uh, you know, and, and so on, whether they're shooting guard or not. And then they're looking at how they are shooting record with respect to the role they play. So of course you can do sports analytics. Um, and then lastly, I want to emphasize, there's a lot of open questions in here precisely because it's very flexible. And because it's flexible, there's a lot of parameters. How do you tune those parameters is a very interesting thing. So how do we stable range of parameters? This is say the number of intervals and the amount of percentage of overlap. Okay. How do you choose a clustering algorithm? How do you choose a filter function, right? And of course, how do you visualize it so that it's more insightful? Okay. And there's been other variations in the mapper algorithm. And then there's still very active research area um, in topological data analysis and computational topology where people trying to figure out different variants of this algorithm and sort of better automatic parameter tuning. Okay. So that's that I want to say today. I'm going 